Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. 1938 was a tense year across Europe. Many suspected another world war was on the way. The Nazis had expanded what they called the Third Reich by amalgamating Germany and Austria before they went on to seize the Sudetenland, a region of Czechoslovakia. Nevertheless, most still hoped, even prayed, that there could be peace in Europe. Understandably, few wanted another world war. In September 1938, the eyes of the world focused on a meeting between Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, and Adolf Hitler, the German Chancellor, in Munich, in Germany. Surprisingly, the outcome seemed positive, so much so that Chamberlain arrived back to cheering crowds in England and famously claimed that he had secured peace for our time. While war still broke out less than 12 months later, in 1939, there were those for whom the horrors of war had already begun. Indeed, only five weeks after Hitler met Chamberlain in Munich in 1938, the Nazis unleashed a wholesale attack on Jewish communities within their borders. On November the 9th and 10th, 1938, Jewish-owned shops and businesses were attacked. Synagogues were burned to the ground and around 100 Jews were killed, while 30,000 were arrested and taken to concentration camps. This event, known as the Night of the Broken Glass, or Kristallnacht in German, was greeted with outrage across the world. However, there were also those, indeed sadly far too many, who were unsympathetic to the plight of the Jews. Indeed, such people were to be found in influential positions in Ireland. The Irish envoy to Berlin, Charles Bewley, was openly anti-Semitic in his reports back to Dublin in December 1938, where he seemed to justify the persecution of the Jews. In what amounted to little more than an anti-Semitic diatribe, he ludicrously and falsely claimed, it is a notorious fact that the international white slave traffic is controlled by Jews. Despite witnessing the brutality of Kristallnacht firsthand, he would write to Dublin in January 1939, explicitly hostile to the idea that Jewish refugees would be allowed into the country. However, while Beauty showed no compassion or humanity, another Irishman, Hubert Butler, then living in the Third Reich, was horrified by Kristallnacht. He later remembered the terror as he walked down a street where he lived the day after. The street must have had a great many Jewish shopkeepers in it because all the way down there were broken windows in front of the looted shops and the air was full of mindless hatred that war, which fosters all our basest passion, would inevitably make murderous. This man was no ordinary tourist. Indeed, Hubert Butler was proving himself one of the most unlikely and somewhat forgotten Irish heroes. He was, in fact, living in the Third Reich precisely to help Jews. Later described as a tall, aristocratic-looking Irishman with kind blue eyes by a man he saved, Hubert Butler was something of an outsider back in Ireland, and his somewhat unusual upbringing was part of the journey that led him to help desperate Jews on the eve of World War II and the Holocaust. Hubert Butler is a man almost impossible to explain in a line, or even ten lines. A distant relative of the Butler Marquis of Ormond, one of Ireland's most powerful Anglo-Irish aristocratic families, he was born into privilege. While he himself hailed from a minor branch of his powerful family, the Butlers of Maidenhall, they were nevertheless wealthy by contemporary standards. If his ancestors were anything to go by, Hubert would not have been a man to risk his neck for others, let alone people in a distant land. His great-grandfather, a Protestant clergyman, Dr Butler, was so hated in his native Kilkenny during what was known as the Tide War, a campaign of resistance to taxes to the Protestant Church in the 1830s, that he had to emigrate temporarily. Hubert himself was at times something of an enigma. Supportive of Irish independence, he was something of a revisionist who was always keen to draw attention to the contributions to Irish society made by the Anglo-Irish aristocracy. Something of a rebel all his life, who regarded Wolf Tone, the father of Irish republicanism, his hero, he spent the great rebellion of his youth, the Irish War of Independence, in the heart of the British Empire at Oxford University, being a less than average student. While Hubert held a very different perspective on the world from his ancestors, the fact that he was an uncompromising Protestant who had little truck for the Catholic Church ensured he struggled to find a place in an Ireland after independence, an increasingly Catholic state intolerant of other religious ideas. Indeed, many other aristocratic families left Ireland in the 1920s. Nevertheless, Hubert's family remained at their home in Maidenhall in Kilkenny. 
Through the 20s and 30s he travelled extensively, experiences that would later prove crucial. While he trained as a librarian, he had become an archaeologist, historian and something of a man of leisure by the mid-1920s. In these years, he travelled far and wide and gained an insight into parts of Europe where tensions building would later explode into war in 1939. In 1927, he was in Egypt, while four years later he found himself teaching English in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, in what was then the Communist Soviet Union. By the mid-1930s, he was living in the former Yugoslavia, by 1938 he could speak French, German, Russian and after living in Zagreb between 1934 and 1937, Serbo-Croat. Clearly something of an adventurer at heart, his decision to travel to the Nazi Third Reich in 1938 began somewhat innocuously after reading a newspaper about the persecution of the Jews. This was the age before the internet or email and even phones were limited. While he presumably had written in advance, he was taking a huge risk even though he was fluent in German. The Nazi Third Reich was, even by 1938, a violent society where outsiders, particularly those helping Jews, were not exactly welcomed with open arms. In Vienna, then part of the Third Reich, he began working at the Quaker International Centre, a religious organisation helping Jewish people seeking to leave. In the coming months, Hubert, along with others, realising for Jews to find countries willing to allow them enter, they needed more skills. He established an organisation called the Kagrin Group, which trained Jewish professionals with no experience in manual labour, the basics of grafting in fields and the like. This massively increased their chances of getting a visa. Through this work, the group succeeded in helping 150 Jews and others escape, including some who came to stay temporarily with Hubert's in-laws, the Guthrie family, in Monaghan. Indeed, in those dark years in Vienna in 1938 and early 1939, Hubert Butler proved something of an inspiration. One German trade unionist who refused to divorce his Jewish wife and faced imprisonment in Dachau concentration camp remembered Hubert who, while being a pleasant man, could easily flash with righteous indignation at the many instances of beastliness that made the life of Vienna of 1938. While his heroism might seem obvious to us, there were few who appreciated his selfless acts in the 1930s. In Ireland it was difficult for most to relate or appreciate what he was doing. He certainly did not return home to a hero's welcome. Patrick Kavanagh, Ireland's great poet from these years, brilliantly contextualised the events of 1938 as Hitler met Chamberlain in Munich from the perspective of rural Ireland. In his poem epic about a minor squabble over land in 1938, Kavanagh asked, That was the year of the Munich bother, which was more important? This articulation of the very natural tendency to focus on problems close at hand must have been very alienating for Hubert Butler when he returned to Ireland in 1939. Perhaps it was this, in part at least, that would later make him reflect. I believe one of the happiest times of my life was when I was working for Austrian Jews in Vienna in 1938 to 1939. It is strange to be happy when others are miserable. The reason surely is that we have always known of the immense unhappiness that all humanity has to suffer. We read about it in newspapers and hear about it on the radio and can do nothing about it. While you might think that after World War II, when the true extent of the Holocaust was known and widely reported, Hubert Butler would be finally lauded as a hero. However, the sad reality was that he was vilified in Ireland when he tried to uncover dark truths about the Holocaust in Yugoslavia. In 1941, while World War II reached its darkest chapter after the Nazis invaded Eastern Europe and then the Soviet Union, Hubert Butler moved with his wife and young daughter to his family home of Maiden Hall, which he inherited on the death of his father that year. The surrounding countryside of Kilkenny was a garden of delight for a man with a love of history like his. The landscape of rural Kilkenny is pockmarked with castles, abbeys and priories. In 1944, Hubert refounded the Kilkenny Archaeological Society and re-established the journal, the Old Kilkenny Review. However, neither controversy, his outrage at injustice or his interest in international affairs were in any way dulled and in 1947, Hubert Butler stepped into the greatest battle of his life, one that related to war crimes in World War II, fascism and the Catholic Church, a heady mix in Ireland in the 1940s. When World War II came to an end in 1945, Hubert Butler could only wonder about all the people he had known in his travels in the 1920s and 30s. 
Leningrad, the city where he had taught English in 1931, had endured a 900-day siege where the population had been reduced to cannibalism. Much of Eastern Europe had also been decimated and unsurprisingly it was Zagreb, the city in which he had lived for three years between 1934 and 1937, that he decided to visit and track down old friends. This would result in Hubert uncovering deeply uncomfortable truths, which were particularly controversial in Ireland. On arriving in what was then Yugoslavia, Hubert found a war-ravaged country. World War II had been particularly ferocious in the region, with well over one million people being killed. And to understand the explosive nature of what Hubert uncovered, we need to look briefly at the war in the region. The Nazis had invaded what was Yugoslavia in 1941. However, the situation was deeply complex, with many ethnic groups, including Croats, Bosnians and Serbs, all living in the region. The Nazis were aided by a Croatian puppet government called the Ustashi to control the wider Yugoslavia. The Ustashi were in the mould of the Nazis, however they were also extreme Catholics who preached what was in effect a genocide against the Serbs, Orthodox Christians and the Jewish population. From 1941 onwards, they, along with the Nazis, began to commit massacres on a large scale. However, such was the ferocity of the Ustashi killings that even Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the Nazi SS, was shocked when he visited the region. Towards the end of the war, the region was liberated by Yugoslavian communists, led by Josip Broz, better known as Marshal Tito. It was only then that the truth of the Nazi occupation and the Holocaust began to emerge. Not long after the war, Marshal Tito's government released a cache of documents claiming the Catholic Church had colluded in the crimes of the Ostashi, that priests had even participated in massacres. This was a very grave accusation, but given that Tito's government were communists, the Vatican and many in the West immediately dismissed the document as propaganda. However, given Hubert's intimate understanding of the region, its people and the language, he gained something of a unique insight for a Westerner into what had really happened. Suspecting that the Yugoslavian government had not in fact forged documents implicating the church, Hubert went into the archives and looked at the original sources. There he discovered that the Catholic Church had in fact been complicit in the Ustashi regime and the Holocaust. The Ustashi leader, Ante Pavlicek, was eulogised in the Catholic press in the country. Only weeks before the deportation of the Jewish population of Zagreb to their deaths, a Catholic publication called St Anthony's Messenger claimed that there are too many Jews in Zagreb with their aims of world domination and their perfidy and destructiveness. It went on to say in a chilling tone that Pavlicek, the Ustashi leader, had decided the Jewish question must be radically solved. Furthermore, he also discovered that the primate of the church in the region, Archbishop Stepanich, while criticising Ustashi violence in public, had in fact given their regime support when it was being established, even though it was clear they were anti-Semitic and intensely violent. If you are interested in reading more of Hubert's findings about Yugoslavia, he penned them in an article called The Yugoslav Papers, The Church and Its Opponents. In the late 1940s, these were explosive findings. To confirm the Catholic Church had supported a regime that had participated in the Holocaust and committed unspeakable war crimes against Orthodox Christians, Serbs and Jews. While this had taken place over 2,000 kilometres from Ireland, it was there that the battle over the truth of these allegations would take place for Hubert. What Hubert could do with the evidence was not clear. After World War II, few wanted to examine the role of the Catholic Church, particularly in the West. Furthermore, a man who was Protestant was on shaky grounds making such accusations against the Catholic Church in an extremely Catholic Ireland. Being the man he was, however, he couldn't stay silent. While he published articles in minor journals, the issue only really began to make the headlines in 1952, but not for the right reasons. That year, while attending a meeting of the Foreign Affairs Association in Dublin, he brought up the issue of the Church's role in events in Yugoslavia. In Ireland, in the 1950s, while such criticism of the Church was not technically illegal, it was considered criminal by most. To make matters worse, the Papal Nuncio or Vatican Ambassador, Patrick Aloysius O'Hara, was present at the Foreign Affairs Association when Hubert raised the matter. The nuncio walked out to illustrate that he could not in any way condone the claims. In an Ireland riven with a strange mix of fear and adoration of the church authorities, the reaction was ridiculously over the top. 
the meeting of the Foreign Affairs Association was immediately suspended, bringing even more attention to what became known as the Nuncio Affair. For most, any criticism of the Catholic Church in the 1950s could not be countenanced. While Hubert stated he was unaware of the Nuncio's presence, and did not mean it as a personal insult, he was roundly attacked in the press. Worse, though, was yet to come when his own community turned on him. While a motion to expel him from the Kilkenny Archaeological Society over the matter failed, he was nevertheless forced to resign as the honorary chair of the organisation he had refounded eight years earlier. The Council of the Corporation of Kilkenny passed a motion condemning Hubert, and to illustrate the way many people viewed the church at the time, one member even suggested that they take an oath of loyalty to the papal nuncio. He was, in effect, forced into an internal exile as he had to resign from the County Agricultural Committee and even the Ancient Monuments Subcommittee of Kilkenny County Council. Many in Kilkenny shunned him in the street as he and his family were ostracised. His only crime had been to speak the truth, a truth, though, very few wanted to hear. One of the few voices that called for a reasonable debate on the matter was Owen Sheehy Skeffington, the son of the famous Francis Sheehy Skeffington, the pacifist executed by the British Army during the 1916 Rising in Dublin. This lone voice could do little and there was no debate around what Hubert had actually said or whether it was true. Instead, he was unfairly vilified as a Stalinist, an agent of Marshal Tito or a communist, none of which he was. Remarkably, this did not break Hubert Butler's spirit and he would go on to take principal stands for the rest of his life. In the early 60s, at the age of 62, he travelled the deep south of the US in a greyhound bus to communities mobilising around civil rights, trying to understand religious and racial integration, no doubt hoping to learn something that could be applied in Ireland. In 1956, he aided refugees fleeing from Soviet persecution of the Hungarian uprising. In 1973, he aided refugees fleeing from the US-backed coup d'etat in Chile, which deposed the socialist Salvador Allende and installed General Pinochet, who unleashed a reign of terror. In 1974, he received some recognition for his efforts around Yugoslavia from the Patriarch of Constantinople, the head of the Orthodox Church. Back in Ireland, it was his considerable talents as a writer that gained fame. However, even though his political stands shone through in this writing, no one apologised for the appalling way he had been treated in the 1950s, right up to the day he died at the age of 91 in the year 1991. It is an unusual testament to Hubert Butler that while he may have admirers across the world, it's doubtful there is a single person who could be described as a follower of his. It would be almost impossible to share his wide-ranging and at times seeming contradictory views. He had many varied opinions, often controversial at times, perhaps influenced by his unique upbringing and life experiences. His views on Irish history could be considered revisionist. He was a Zionist who visited Israel and stayed on a kibbutz in 1980, while in 1983 he campaigned from a pro-choice position on abortion when the Eighth Amendment was being introduced into the Irish Constitution. While he never received recognition for his bravery or even an apology for his appalling treatment for revealing the reality of what the church had done in Yugoslavia, in the year 2000 he did receive a posthumous apology from the Lord Mayor of Kilkenny. This was a nice recognition from a later generation who acknowledged the sins of their forefathers, but it was all too late for Hubert Butler, a truly remarkable man. Before I sign off, don't forget to get your copy of 1348 A Medieval Apocalypse, The Black Death in Ireland, it's available now at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Until next time, slán.